welcome to my channel Hi everybody. Um, as you can see, it's very early in the morning. I think you can see it's 6 a.m. and I haven't slept. Last night I uploaded the um, uh, episode on the missing um, cold case, uh, the vanished child, Robbie Brown, and um, while I was going through that story, I did notice some discrepancies between um, the book version or this website that is going by the book version written by, um, well, uh, uh, written by Rose McCormick Brandon, but it, she actually ghosted Shirley Brown. And so um, it was written for Shirley Brown. It's a 56 page book. And unfortunately I could not find the print version online like I did Kate's book, for example. And so I couldn't go through it and check out the story. Um, so I already mentioned to you that discrepancy between the police story that they were heading to camp, to the Church of Nazareth camp, to have dinner. Well, that 
wasn't what she said in the book. Uh, what she said was they were going home for dinner. They left the beach to go home. That's a big difference. And now, um, so one, one thing that I did find that really changed um, my mind about the possibility that um, somebody very close to Robbie Brown may have been involved. And so um, I want you to remember the episode, oh, maybe two months ago now, <clears throat> excuse me, where I spoke about um, the criminal, uh, the psychological profile of a, a criminal, a child abuser, a child killer. And so um, I remember we went through um, all the attributes and characteristics, you know, great personality, um, very generous and giving and warm-hearted, popular, very sociable, but also sometimes very religious, you know, very spiritual. I don't know why, but that is a classical, it seems to be, no matter where I check, a classical symptom. Oh, I'm not saying that the parents were involved. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that um, it could have very well have been somebody in that setting, maybe a teacher, maybe a student, I don't know. But um, because there's a discrepancy between Shirley Brown's story and the, the account that the police have, I have to wonder, I have to wonder why there's that discrepancy. Um, the same thing came up with um, Yvonne LaRue's story, that one parent did not tell um, the, the same truth as was reported in the police report or in the police file. And how would it get there if it wasn't truthful? And so if we go back to the Yvonne LaRue case, you'll remember exactly what it was, that um, somebody said she was going to hitch a ride home from the hospital, and somebody else, Yvonne's mother, said, no, I was picking her up. She was waiting for me. You know, when you hear and come across conflicts and co um, contradictions like that in a story, you know that something is being covered up. And what I think here, guys, is that, um, you know, um, one day after Robbie Brown went missing, um, I found this article online that really woke me up to other possibilities. And so it so happened that um, Shirley Brown used to work in her parents' grocery store. And so one day after Robbie Brown um, went missing, um, this woman came into the store and recognized her as the mother of the missing child. And she said, you know what? I'm having a seance. Now, guys, I would have said, take the hike out of here because I'm scared of those things. But um, not that I really believe in ghosts, but I would have said, okay, stop. Um, this woman said, I want you to come to my house. I want you to have a seance with me so we can try to find out where he is. Right away, Shirley Brown climbed up. And she is pinning it. This is what she said to her. She said, um, my heart ached to know where my son was, but I knew this wasn't the route God wanted me to take. Okay. Um, so, uh, the you know, she, what she said to the woman, what Shirley said to the woman was kind of upsetting. I talk to God every day, and when he wants me to know where my son is, he'll tell me. I don't know if she meant literally or giving her a sign. 
And, you know, um, what the woman responded to her was, was, you know, well, God works through spiritualists too, you know. He's a spiritualist too. He's not a demon. He's not, a, 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 you know, um, an evil force just because you're into spirituality. But this woman, Shirley Brown, had been a Christian for only over, a little over a year. And I'm assuming she was about 30 years old, something like that. And so I'm kind of wondering, um, I, you know, I'm just wondering, I'm curious. I'm not accusing anybody of every, anything, but this is a little weird. This, the story in itself is weird to begin with, but Shirley Brown's reaction was to shut herself completely off and close herself in and not want to know anything at all. I mean, I, I do believe in psychic powers. Um, obviously, I don't have any, but I do believe in psychic powers. And, um, you know, if I had a child who was missing, I'm not going to say that she did the wrong thing. I would probably be very curious. I mean, look what the McCanns did. They consulted for for um, psychics. And, uh, you know, it, it didn't make them bad people, evil people. You know what I'm saying? And so um, fortune tellers and false prophets, prophets are, are demonic. That's the um, attitude that Shirley Brown was um, uh, approaching the problem of her son's disappearance. She was taking that sort of attitude. And so practically any approach at all would have been evil the way that I'm, I'm reading about it. So um, what happened, guys, is that the night before Robbie went missing, he went out to some sort of fair fair um, event with his friends and he missed his curfew. And so guys, um, it could be, I, I don't know what happened to him, but it could be that because he was being punished, he was sitting home with his little baby sister, Catherine. And so even though people are saying that he was doting on little baby Catherine, it's unnatural for a young boy of 12, 13 to want to stay home with his baby sister and change her diapers. It is very unnatural. But, you know, I'm sure that he cared about his sister. But he had friends. And so it, it could be. You know, uh, remember Calvin Hoover and his jealousies? Um, I don't know what it is, guys. But this is the sort of thing that creates fury in people who have emotional problems. And emotional problems with uh, human attachments. And so maybe whoever this person might have been didn't want Robbie to go out with his friends or not because he stayed out late, but because that's how killers are. Mind you, there very well may have been a good reason why um, missing curfew, now I don't know how late he was getting in, but there probably was a good reason. You know, you don't want your kid um, going, hanging around late at night with creeps you don't know. Um, so what happened was, guys, the next day, when Robbie said that he was going to walk home and meanwhile deliver the telegram papers and then come back to the camp when he was finished, that isn't what, what, it, it, you know, that isn't what was supposed to have been done. That isn't what the plan was. The plan was that they were going to go home. 
not go to the camp. So this is all mixed up. And um, so what happened was the way the story is being explained by the book and by Shirley Brown is that he suddenly changed his mind and told his mother he was going to hang around the house when he was finished with his paper route. So um, <clears throat> what she did was she said, okay, but don't go anywhere else. And so where was that conversation about being home by, by 6.30 for dinner? I, I, I don't understand. Were they going to the camp for dinner or were they going to go home for dinner? It's still not clear. Something is being lied about. And I know that the police wouldn't probably have any reason to change the report. But this is a sight different from what the police report said. And so um, she said, okay, go home, but don't go anywhere else. So what I think was that his mother was supposed to cook at the camp while the kids were home. I, I'm not sure. Now, so Robbie walks away, waving to his mother and to his sister, Catherine. And um, that was the last time they saw him. However, um, what happened was that Robbie again changed his mind and went back to the beach. Instead of going through his paper route, he went back to the beach and something that the beach attendant was able to confirm later, um, that's weird. So um, Shirley Brown was the last person to see him alive other than the beach attendant. So, um, Shirley Brown discovered years later that her son, Michael, the six-year-old, um, had been holding on to a secret for years. And so on that day, guys, just minutes before they realized that Robbie was late, um, he did see his brother, Robbie, walking along Pfeiffer Law Road on the curve just before Highway 48. Now, I know that highway pretty well. It's not a real highway. Um, and it, it takes you all throughout all the cities across GTA. Just follow it. And so um, what happened was Michael was in a car uh, coming back to the, he was coming back to the church ground, campground, from swimming with another family. So where was Michael? Wasn't he at the church camp? Why was he swimming with another family? Okay, so he was coming home or going back to the church campground with another family when he spotted his older brother. Why were they all going to the campground and Robbie going home. This is a jumbled up story. Um, and so Michael, Michael saw him and um, he, he waved at him. I, I assume that he waved at him. And so for a long time after his brother went missing, Michael thought that if he had done something different, maybe jumped out of the car and, and walked along with him, he would have been able to change the course of fate for Robbie. Maybe he would have been protecting Robbie um, if, if he had been, you know, together with him. And so um, he carried this guilt. Michael, little Michael carried the guilt around silently for many, many years before he finally broke down and told Shirley his secret. And Really, actually, she assured her son, who was absolutely, you know, sick over this, that there was really nothing that he could have done. Well, no, he, he, but, you know, when you, you, 
your mind goes there. Um, I, I don't know. I don't, it depends on who, what happened to him. And so, um, Mrs. Brown, Mr. and Mrs. Brown, um, they came home at about 6.30. And um, they were met by Ross Jr. and Michael. And they all talked about it and said, well, okay, he's not home yet. He probably ran into one of his friends again. And again, lost track of time, like he told us last night. So, guys, um, I'm, I'm finding so many things that were weird about this story. And I can't get a good grip on what was really going on. People were going and coming, like in the McCann story. People were going to their apartments to check on their kids. They were coming back. They were going to the beach. They were going up to the apartment. You know, nothing coincides properly. I, I still don't understand why... Um, I know that Mrs. Brown worked at the camp kitchen. I know that. So probably she was trying to cook dinner at home and at the camp. You know what I'm saying? But she didn't tell, she didn't do a very good job of telling that story. And so um, I know that I only intended to do one part to this story, but I realized that there was too much else um, you know, floating around. And like the Cheryl Hansen case and the Yvonne LaRue case and a couple of others, I, I really think that there's a lot more to this story than is um, being let on. And I, I really think that somebody is holding back the truth. And I think it, it's, it's a weird situation. Um, a lot of people who were there were maybe homeless. I'm not saying they were. Uh, maybe it was supposed to have been a safer environment for the children. But, you know, when you're dealing with uh, camps and churches and things like that, sometimes people who are passing through are in trouble and troubled. And maybe Robbie met up with somebody who was just an unsavory character. I don't know, but really, I I would look at um, Shirley Brown's story very carefully because uh, there are too many things that don't make sense. Uh, whether or not she's telling the truth, um, I'm sure she's telling the truth, but she's doing it in a roundabout way. And so I, I think that there are too many loopholes in the story. With people coming and going like that, back and forth, you don't know what's going on. You know what I'm saying? And so I think the opportunity to bring harm to this little Robbie Brown would have been pretty ample. Nobody knew exactly where anybody was at any given moment. They were here, they were there, they were coming, they were going. It's a big confusion. But, um, you know, that that is a remote area. It's still a remote area. And I, I really don't see how a child can go missing in such a huge expanse of land like that without a, a good indication of what happened to him. Now, mind you, <clears throat> if the um, if the perpetrator was assisting in a search, that would have been it. Um, no matter what anybody says, when somebody who's guilty assists in a search, I I remember Calvin Hoover. Um, remember Adam Strong? He assisted with a, a police search a few years before he, you know, he was arrested. And he had that tie with the police. So, um, I don't understand how these people get away with it. 
But I, what I'm saying is that Mrs. Shirley Brown's book may have been written in order to protect people, in order to cover up other ugly truths about their family. Maybe there was a child molester in a family, or maybe a neighbor was a child molester. Something is being hidden. Something, maybe not that, but something along the lines is being, you know, hidden. And so um, it's such a baffling case. I, I, I feel as though it's staring at me right in the face and I don't know what it is, but the truth is right there, you know? Anyway, guys, I'm going to cut it short. I have done such an enormous amount of physical work in that room behind me. And um, it's about finished, but I don't want to look at it. And so um, yesterday, I, I thought I would be in a lot of pain, but I'm not. I had to climb and, and jump down, climb and jump down all day long. And I feel pretty good. I, I feel like, you know, I can go out for another walk. <laughs> and um, too much housework makes me go stir crazy. And once I start, it's very hard for me to stop. And that's because I put off so many things um, over and over again. And so now, from last spring to this spring, that's what pro procrastination did to me. So... Anyway, guys, um, I thank you very much for watching. I hope you found it interesting. And I hope you take what I say with a grain of salt, because I don't know. I'm just entertaining different alternatives as to what the truth could actually be. And I know this is a confusing mess to me, but that's the way they presented it. Um, the police... And the websites, the book I can't get into. So anyway, thank you very much for watching. And please don't forget to like and subscribe. Bye for now.